Hello, my planty friends. It's Nick with Propist. Welcome or welcome back. Glad to have you here. I have 10 different plants today that have either new leaves or new growth. You take your pick. Each one of these, I will give you the story of how I acquired it and what my experience has been like with each one. So I hope you'll join me as we explore some of these new growth bits throughout my collection. I've selected all the plants here for different reasons. Some of them just have big new growth that's pretty cool to show you. And some of them, it's more how they're growing and why they're growing the way they are and what's impressing me about their resilience and that kind of thing. I thought today would be an interesting time to show you a few things that have been growing in my grow tent, a few things that have been growing outside of my grow tent, some experimental stuff that's either going well or not. We'll see how it goes. For each one of these plants, I'm pretty sure you're gonna find something interesting about it. You may want to buy one yourself and I'll give you my growth experience with it, whether or not I've had a good time, whether I've taken good care of it or not, that's an important factor here, and whether I would buy it again. And as impressive as some of these new growth bits may be, some of these plants I probably wouldn't buy again, or at least maybe not the same way I purchased it the first time. Now I'm sure you can see a few of these plants hanging out behind me here. I, this is purely because I ran out of space on my table over here. So it's basically whatever I could fit on my two side tables. That's what you're getting to see today. Some of these plants are imports. Some of them have been acquired locally. Some of them are imports that have then been passed along locally and then sold on to me. Some of them I don't really know the history of. So I think today we're gonna keep things pretty simple. Out of the 10 plants, I have a number of anthuriums. I have a handful of philodendrons. I have one alocasia and I have one Hoya. So I just wanna preface this by saying that I have a full-time job. I work for a very, very large software organization that you know. If you have a computer, you probably know them. They are big. I have three kids, a wife, a house, a mortgage, etc. So taking care of plants is not first fiddle on my list of things to do. Now, as much as I love my plants, I'm not the greatest carer of plants and I have plants that die left and right all the time. I have learned my lesson over the few years now that I've been collecting that I have a limit. I have a threshold where I can only collect so much and then things just start to fall off. So to me, the stuff that survives and thrives in my chaotic environment at home and with work because I work from home, if those plants survive and do well for me, then that's a good sign that I have a keeper. I'm gonna have an element of that thrown in there. Like every time I tell you whether or not I'm gonna buy a plant again or I would buy a plant again, it's because of my experience with it, but also because of my care habits and how I take care of them. And just like the lack of maintenance some of these things need slash get. So based off of that, please just make your own decisions based on your own kind of habits, climate, what kind of lifestyle you lead, whether or not you can take a vacation for a week or two without worrying about your plants. Those are all things that you have to take into account. So if you have a huge collection, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you're just starting out, I'll try and give you the pointers as to like whether or not these are things that are going to require a ton of maintenance or not. Looking through all the plants I have here, Based off of that, pick stuff that you can care for, that you feel comfortable caring for. But like my recommendations, all of these I think are pretty low maintenance plants. So you know what? Let's start off with the first plant right now. So first things first, let's address the elephant-like plant in the room because you know, the skin and also the fact that it's huge. This here is an Anthurium Magnificum X Luxuriens. This has put on two new leaves while sitting in water. Yes, I am lazy. Yes, I have not repotted this and it's been sitting in here forever. I wanna say it's been in here for a good four or five months now. So two leaves may not be impressive to you, but two leaves while sitting on the top of my Ikea cabinet with a pretty weak LED light in water, and it's not even getting semi-hydro nutrients. This is just getting like super basic feed. And the fact that it's put on this monster leaf, which is crisping a teensy bit at the end here, and this guy, this new guy just popping in now, which I'm looking forward to seeing how big this one gets because the last one was bigger than every leaf on the plant. Now you can tell this is a Magnificum hybrid just due to the square petioles. I'll see if I can give you guys a bit of a close up on that. The Luxurians is pretty obvious just from the leaf shape. I mean, that's just pretty spectacular. I'd say that the Magnificum X Luxurians doesn't have the thickness and durability of uh, luxuriance by itself. You can feel that the leaves are just a little bit thinner than a Lux, and Luxes are just tough as nails. So I'm hoping that this guy holds up. Now, considering the fact that he's been sitting in water, you can see from the tag there, this was an Equigener import. I think I got it back in, when did I pick this guy up? April? 
Something like that. It's been about four four months or so. The coolest part of this thing is that I've barely had to do anything to keep this happy. And I did clean up the roots at one point. I think the roots probably need another go over just removing some of the dead root material. But you can see there, like most of those roots are nice and happy and green. You can also see this baggie I've got hanging on here. This baggie here, in case you're curious what it's for, this is beneficial insects from my usual distributor, Grow Live in Canada here. So these here, are Neoseulus, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Cucumeris, which I think do reasonably well in kind of like mid to high humidity in warmer climates. So, I mean, my downstairs is not all that warm to begin with, so it's probably not all that effective sitting out in the open air. And I should mention this has been sitting in open air, not inside my grow tent. So even more impressive that it's put on a leaf that's definitely over 12 inches. And this new one, I don't know how big that's gonna get, but I'll let you know when it does fill out. The Anthurium Maglux, I would absolutely buy again because it seems to be able to grow in anything. Even the more impressive that it's been doing well in that kind of climate. If you're curious about the beneficials, I did talk about that in a recent video. I will link that up here. I did have a pretty good three or four minute tangent where I talked purely about beneficial insects in that one. So if you're curious how to acquire them, what they do, how they work, how well they work, how often you need to buy them, that kind of thing, go check out that video. So moving on to number two, I'm going to move away from the table for a moment and I'm going to try and find something down here. So I'm going to go with the big guns first here. I'm going to show you one of my, whoa, almost dropped it. So I'm going to show you this guy here and this is my Anthurium SP Morona, which just put on this monster new leaf. And this is at least, I want to say about 15 to 17 inches. I mean, it's as long as my arm, probably halfway up my bicep. So this is a big leaf and I'll just give you another good look here so you can see what we're talking about. I'm particularly proud of this guy because for the first eight to nine months of his life, this guy lived on my desk in open air under an LED desk lamp that was on maybe kind of like five to six hours a day. He's been sitting in the original moss and you can see I bought this from our friends over at North Shore Tropicals, it's still in the original container that I bought it in and I have been too lazy to repot it. And now it's so well accustomed to this pot that I'm kind of hesitant to transfer it into something different. If left to my own devices now, I would probably put this into Pawn, my homemade Pawn, which the recipe is floating around the internet all over the place. But if you're interested, I will link to a video where I talk about the components of the homemade Pawn up here. This guy, he lasted, I don't know how long, in fantastic shape sitting on my desk. And I just liked having him there. And he was not growing at all. Like he didn't put on even one new leaf during that period of time until the very end where I saw the initial shoot of a new leaf popping out. At that point, I moved him into my tent because I didn't want that leaf to dry out. Now, of course, in my grow tent, I had an episode of Thrips, which managed to take out two leaves off of this guy by the end of it. So... He was originally a three leaf plant and now he is back to being a three leaf plant. But man, oh man, this leaf is a monster and it is by far the largest leaf on here. I think it's probably a good two, three inches longer than one of the original leaves. But you can see it kind of came out crooked. This I think is the one that came out when I moved it from room humidity into my tent. You can also see the damage. I think it's a bit more pronounced on the back. But you can see the damage there from thrips where it was munched. I gave it a good spray down. I don't think there are any thrips left on here, but the damage is still clear. I didn't have the heart to cut off some of these leaves because I mean, they're still photosynthesizing and they're not as damaged as they could have been. I did, however, take off two leaves. And you can see I've got the stumps of the leaves here, There's one stump and two, and these are actually pretty dried out. So I can just pluck this right off of there now. So I can take that guy off. And I think the other one is Look at that, pops right off. Just a pro tip, if you're cutting leaves off of your anthuriums, just chop the leaf at the stem. Don't try and yank the whole leaf off. Chop it at the stem, wait a couple weeks, wait a month, wait two months, and then the leaves will just dry up and pop off on their own. Easy peasy, don't have to do any work there. This is actually kind of foreign catafils, which is interesting. So yeah, you can see here now that new leaf, and then I think there's a new leaf popping in right here in the center. So I'm very curious to see what that is. It does look like a new leaf coming in. So considering it just popped this sucker out, and I literally only noticed this when I went to water my tent after about three weeks of not watering it, this leaf went from being around this size to being this size 
in the span of three weeks. And I went away, waited a couple weeks, came back, and then I took a look. And this was actually crossing my entire shelving unit from end to end, which is crazy. All things being equal, this Anthurium SP Morona is highly recommended. It is, again, tough as nails. It survived thrips and it barely missed a step with the pretty nasty thrips attack. The leaves are hard as a rock. Like these are solid. Like I don't want to call this like a pendant anthurium because it's it doesn't hang. It actually grows upright. This almost reminds me more of like a bird's nest anthurium. I'm really not sure off the top of my head what the hybrid is for this guy. Also, just in general, I'm not going to get into the history or background of any of the plants I'm showing you today, but if you're curious, you can always look up the names that are down here. I'll try and give you the, the botanical names for everything or post in the comments and I can tell you what I know about it. What I wanted to tell you guys today was mostly about my experience growing them. The SP Morona, it's a, it's a slow grower, at least in room conditions. In my tent, it's been a faster grower, but this is a hardy plant. And if you are a neglectful plant parent like myself, as you can see, you still haven't even repotted this guy. If you're as neglectful as I am, then this is probably right up your alley. All right, we're moving on from the big boy SP Morona to something a little smaller. This one is a little bit nearer and dearer to my heart just purely because this thing has been through the wars. It doesn't look too hot, but here's your taste of variegation for the day. This is my Philodendron White Princess. I think it's done super well considering the climate that it's been in. This guy, girl, I don't know what to, it's a White Princess. I'm not really sure what to call it. This thing has really gone through the wars with me. It's still looking really good at the end of the day. I mean, it's a small plant, but don't get me wrong here. Like there's probably at least I want to say 10 nodes that I can see off the top of my head here that could be propagated off of this thing. These guys have a tendency to lose their variegation pretty regularly. So I thought, you know what, let me see what happens. Now look at this guy. The leaves are pretty damn great. And it's been doing well at maintaining its variegation. I mean, like it did also get munched by the thrips a little bit. And you can see some of the damage on the back of the leaf there. But ever since that, I mean, this leaf has popped up brand new since the thrips and it's looking really nice. But I mean, look at this half moon that came out really nicely. What I really enjoy is this kind of combination of white and mint and a little bit of a flecking kind of going on there and the dark green. And this guy, it's got a nice balanced kind of like speckled variegation, which makes for a really nice leaf, even though it's pretty low var compared to some of the other ones. Like it's still got the white. It's still got patches of the creamy mint in there and it's it's nice and healthy. So in terms of new leaf, there is a new leaf right here popping out right in the center. I had again underwatered this plant. I'm hoping this guy comes out not too bad, but I mean, I can already see it's got some kind of creamy variegation going on in there. Now, the cool thing about the White Princess, though, is that it's got this kind of pinky hue to the petioles, which I think is particularly cool. It's got a nice combination of like white, pale green to mint, speckling and the dark green of the leaves along with kind of a lighter green shade where there's clearly like less layers of variegation in there and it reminds me a little bit i mean without the white that clearly bright like it is here it reminds me a little bit of a uh, monstera high constellation in terms of the speckling effect that you get on the leaves and i'll see if i can give you guys a close-up it's probably not quite so visible here now the tail behind this guy is that <laughs> It's been sitting in moss on a tiny shelf of my grow tent where it's been neglected because I just didn't see it, to be completely honest. I actually I thought it was dead for the longest period of time. I thought it had died somewhere around here where these aerial roots are kind of creeping up here. And I mean, some of these aerial roots are pretty dried out, but the top ones are actually still healthy as far as I can tell. But I mean, this could be propagated. And like, based on the variegation I'm seeing in here, like I feel pretty confident that I could propagate this and get at least one or two variegated plants out of it so i think what i'm going to do is and as i had said before like I, my goal was to let it grow back out a little bit so i could take a top cut and then i could propagate the rest and that's you know typically what i do with plants that have had this type of trauma where they've lost all of their leaves up the entire stem here is why i wait till the top cut is looking pretty decent and then I'll chop it with, you know, three, four nodes underneath that, depending on like how compressed this is. This has very, very tight internodal space, as you can see there. You know, there's like three to five millimeters between the nodes here. So chopping this white princess might be a little bit problematic. So I'll probably leave three or four nodes per chunk that I take out. And then I will leave the bottom cut and see what happens there. So, I mean, I, I'm sure I can get at least a half dozen attempts at plants out of this and probably two fully successful ones from the top and the bottom cut. So 
feeling pretty good about this. And I think at this point, this is ready to propagate. So that's the Philodendron White Princess. You know, it's funny also that I bought this after missing out on a White Princess during an auction that I think was going for close to three figures at the time. And this was when White Princesses were still relatively popular. I don't know what they are now. I actually haven't checked in a while. Maybe these go for like 10 bucks now. But at the time, they were still going for close to $100 from what I remember. And I got this for, I want to say $25 Canadian, which is like $3 US, right? So I, it was a pretty decent deal. And I mean, considering the state it's in, and I haven't really done anything to maintain it. Um, I'm sure this would thrive if I moved it into Leca at this point. So I think what we're going to do here is propagate the top plop that into something to root it up a little bit, and then move it into Leka, and then probably move the bottom into Leka, and then take all the nodes in between and throw them into prop boxes. So would I buy this plant again? Honestly, probably not, and not for the reasons you think. I think for me, the reason I would not buy this plant again has nothing to do with how I've grown it. It's more the fact that these are no longer particularly popular. The variegation is so flaky. I'm just lucky with this one that I have like white variation on at least three or four of these leaves out of five. It's like the pink princess, honestly. If you are not a fan of the pink princess and you don't have the patience to deal with that kind of variegation and continuing to chop it back and keep on propagating it and growing out different pieces until you get what you want. If you don't have that kind of patience, don't buy one of these. Same thing goes for the white knight, the white wizard, the pink princess, whatever you can think, all the, the arabescence in that family, they're all pretty much the same for that. So the variegation to me is such a hassle. I'm just like lazy and lucky with this one in that it's actually put out pretty good variegation. But I mean, I have a pink princess that didn't get variegated until I had put out like foot, foot and a half worth of leaves before I'd put out one variegated pink leaf. If you don't have the patience of a saint, then probably don't do this. The only reason I keep this thing around is that it's doing really well for me. So when it comes to the white princess, I think I come down to the fact that a, they're not all that popular anymore. And same thing goes for all of the other white variants and pink variants of the Philodendron arabescence. But it's also just the fact that the variegation is so sketchy. You just can't rely on it. It's difficult unless you have really awesome genetics in your cutting. And I mean, I must have lucked out with this one and that it's got good genetics. I, the fact that it's got three, four variegated leaves that are all looking quite good and reasonably stable, they're not burning. To me, that's a good sign that this plant is probably worth keeping, but it's so difficult to find what you need here without getting screwed that I would not recommend buying it for anybody who's kind of looking for one right now. Now, if you luck out and someone hands you one or you can get one at a trade or get a really good price on it, like, you know, if it's like sub $15, $20, sure, go for it. But if you're going to spend money on one because it's got good variegation, save yourself the trouble and wait till you can get a cutting off of somebody and just grow out the cutting until you get what you want. You're much better off. So I think we're going to go back to Anthurium land with the next one here. So this Anthurium I prize quite dearly and I was a little worried about it, but I think my worries can, can calm down now. This one here is the Anthurium King of Spades and mine specifically is still a seedling. I want to say it's probably in the seedling category. It's got four leaves. I'm pretty sure I did lose a leaf earlier on. As you can see, it's got some yellowing going on here on one of the bottom leaves and that was, I think that was one of the original leaves and this guy here. And at first I was a little concerned about what might be causing this and I could probably just pull this leaf off, but it's still got some green on it. So typically if a leaf has still got green on it, I will leave it on until it has no more green and the stem is gone yellow or brown, then I'll take it off. In this specific case, I think I know what happened. This was basically the switch between aircon and no aircon in my downstairs. This guy here, you can see it's sitting in a combination of Leca with sphagnum moss on top. And if you take a good look here, you can see that it is very well rooted in here, particularly right there. Some really nice, tasty anthurium roots that are kind of popping up all over the place. This is well rooted. I'm not super concerned about the plant at all. And this is actually the newest leaf here. So talking about new leaves, this is what I had to show you this time around. This is definitely like still not quite a mature looking leaf. You can see it doesn't quite have like that ring around the edge that you get on some of the larger ones, but it's getting there. And really what happened to this plant was that I had first heating on, and this was probably around when the summer clicked in. We had a very late start to our summer, so probably around May. We went from kind of having alternating heating and cooling in the house, aircon to heating. We have a heat pump to just having the aircon on. 
and a lot of anthuriums suffered pretty badly. A lot of the ones I have that are out in open air downstairs, they just hated that. Last year, the problems I had with this were more related to my philodendrons, where I had philodendrons like the majestic dropping leaves. In the case of this king of spades, or who as it's called, or H-U, I'm not really sure what people pronounce that as. I know it stands for Haji Uli, I think it's, if I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize. An Indonesian hybridizer who took this guy and spread him out all over the place. I think they stabilized the traits of the king of spades in the F2 generation, and that's kind of what you see floating around a lot of these guys. I really, really like this plant, and I really, really want to get this guy nice and big. This leaf, as you can see, it's the size of my palm, so it's kind of like five inches across sinus to tip right now. I'd say like, um, it, this is definitely hardened off already, this newest leaf. So I'm gonna give it some time, but I think I'm also gonna transplant this and move it into my tent. The problem I had was that with that trips outbreak in my tent over the course of the summer is that some of the plants I had planned to move into the tent, I couldn't move into the tent because I didn't want them getting the thrips. So I kept this guy out in the open and he's been growing out in the open. Like this leaf, like I said, popped out. This was under a grow light, but this guy specifically was not on a heat mat. So he's been sitting on just regular, you know, unheated surfaces under a grow light that's on for, I want to say around 14 hours a day. And this new leaf came out looking perfect. And this leaf damage is really from before I moved the plant, this was leaning against a couple other pots. And I think the temperature of those pots being cold during the aircon is what burned up the corners of these leaves. And this one has just decided to go. It's just, it's just its time. And you can see like actually the baby leaf at the bottom here, that was one of the original leaves, it's still just doing fine. So as far as I can tell, this was from contact and aircon combined. So for this plant, I think that really what I'm looking at is contact damage on these leaves because you can see this one is actually still quite healthy outside of the crisped up edge there. And this guy, I think, is just giving up the ghost from age of the plant and trying to draw energy into the new leaves. Either way, it could just be from the cold as well. It could be from underwatering. There's a couple of reasons. I think I, I did underwater this guy as well for a little while. Oh, there's this one. This is actually one dead leaf. You can see that's one I chopped off earlier. So there were four leaves on this plant before I put out this new leaf. So I've actually taken one leaf off. So I'm going to leave this guy the way he is currently. I think I will take this one off as soon as there's no more green on there. And as you see that little dried husk, that's what I'm talking about in terms of letting the leaves just dry up after you cut them. So if it doesn't come off easily when you're plucking it off, like this guy here, I, I don't really want to yank on him because he's still got green on it. But if you were to cut that and let the rest of the petiole dry out, once it's ready to go, it'll come off in your fingers without any trouble. So for this guy here, this is a new leaf. It's already hardened off, but I'm going to call it new leaf because I'm just really proud of how it looks already here and that it's still doing quite nicely. And I'm going to transfer this. I think now that I feel like the thrips threat has passed in my tent, I think I can safely migrate this in there because I've had now a number of new leaves grow in the tent without any thrips damage. And that's usually my indicator that the thrips have moved on to the uh, afterlife of thrips, wherever they end up, hopefully somewhere bad, and that my beneficials are doing the job. So on the Anthurium King of Spades front, I would definitely buy this plant again. Now, this is not based off of my experience growing it. This is purely based off of the fact that I love the way this plant looks mature. So I really want to size this thing up until it starts having some of those outer markings and like you can really see the King of Spades-y look. And again, I'll show you a mature one up here so you can see what I'm talking about, but I really want to size it up. So absolutely, I would buy this one again if I happen to kill this one. I would make a full-on attempt to go get another one. But I, so far, this guy's doing really well. So I hope that this will survive and continue thriving. So there you go. That's the Anthurium King of Spades, or H-U, who, whatever you want to call it. All right, for the next one here, we're going to go a little bit off the beaten path. We're going to get into a completely different genus. I think I only have one of these today. I have plenty of these, and I've shown you a number of these in the past as well. But today, I'm going to show you something very tiny. This is an Alocasia infernalis. And the reason I'm showing you this is not only does it have a couple of nice little leaves in here, the reason I'm showing you this plant is not so much of, this is not an impressive specimen at all. And I will show you a mature form of this plant just because it's one of my favorite Alocasias. And the reason I'm showing you this tiny plant is because this is number three. I've had three of these and they all died. 
full grown uh, that I've spent money on, brought them in. And this is the only one out of those three that survived. And I am so far keeping this thing in protective custody here. It's sitting inside its little container and I water it here and there. It doesn't lose a lot of humidity because it's sitting in pond inside of a sealed container with no airflow at all. And it's gonna stay that way until it's looking robust enough to move. So long story short, I have brought in two of these from the East Coast from guys who were importing them from Southeast Asia. I think they were coming from a TC lab in all cases. And this one specifically, I actually got from here in Vancouver, hilariously, for much less money than the other two that I brought in. To the point where now, I mean, the Infernalis used to be like a three-figure plant back in the day, back in the peak of COVID times. This was a very hard plant to find. And as you can see from the pictures here, it looks spectacular when it's big and beautiful and growing fully. This was very difficult to find here on the West Coast in Vancouver. And I had a really hard time just finding it online either. So I managed to find two of them through Facebook channels coming from out east. I brought them in and one of them came as a plug in soil and it just hated my climate and it died almost immediately. The second one that I brought in was doing really, really well. I had it sitting in, again, a pretty enclosed environment. That one, I'm, my guess is that it was an overwatering issue. It was in pawn and it went from kind of one day looking healthy to the next day being just flat and the roots were rotten on it. And I'm pretty sure that it was either a transfer issue from going from the substrate that it was in, which I think was water for a period of time, into pawn and it just didn't like the transition. And really, I think at that point was when I decided to myself that like for any large alocasia from now on, pretty much going to put them all into LECA. I've had much better luck with alocasias in LECA than in Pawn. And like, as most of you guys know that I'm a semi-hydro guy. So like, as you've seen from every other video I've posted here, the majority of my plants are in semi-hydro. The ones that aren't are going to end up in semi-hydro. This specific case is in Pawn because I was experimenting and also because I think the original plantlet that I got was in pond to begin with. So I just wanted to keep it in one it was already comfortable in. But if this thing grows a thick enough rhizome at the bottom there that I'm feeling confident in it, which means like I'm probably gonna have to move it up one size of container, probably to my 20 ounce cup containers with the rounded dome on here. I have the bigger size. I'll move into that in the next iteration here. I think we're pretty much at that point now because it's really topping out in here. At that point, I'll let it size up a little bit in there and I'm gonna transfer it into LECA because my luck with pond is that I find that the top dries out quite a bit and alocasias don't like to have any of their roots drying out particularly with pawn i have that issue where the top dries out if it's sitting in the tent or in open air it's even worse where you've got like a kind of low relative humidity around here and when you've got an air con or you've got a heat pump going on your relative humidity drops like a rock so i mean when you're in a sealed environment like this it's not a problem but when you start getting into a larger container with pawn you end up with the top like centimeter drying up and if the plant can't tolerate that like it's not hardy enough to handle having its top roots or even some of the aerial roots not submerged or not sitting in something moist then you're gonna kill it so this is my experience so for any of you who've had different experiences i'm sure everyone has their climate like your local environment and that kind of microclimate informs every decision you have to make about your plants so i would say to you like go with what works for you if that means for you that pawn works great, or if that means for you that soil in your house works great, or if you're using some other funky substrate, like, you know, maybe you're in tree fern, or maybe you're in an aeroid mix of your own concoction, go with what works in your environment. Just remember that in your own home, you can have multiple different microclimates, combining the light, the watering habits that you have, the airflow and the humidity that's happening in that current zone, all of those things come into play and temperature, obviously. Did I mention temperature? I think I forgot the key one there, temperature. A lot of these plants, if you start going to, you know, at nighttime, it starts going sub 17, 18 degrees Celsius, you're gonna see it on the plants by the end of it. If you start going into those temperatures at night, even your air con at night in the summertime, the plants are gonna suffer for it. I mean, I can tell you my Philodendron Majestic last year dropped about 10 leaves off of uh, what was a five foot tall plant in the course of probably three weeks. That was a very frustrating experience. So take it from me, like see what works in your environment at home, figure out what really works well for you, and then go from there.
So that all being said, Alocasia Infernalis, nothing to look at right now. It's pretty small, nothing too special, but you know what, to me, this is a success. So I'm gonna take the small successes with the big ones and I'm gonna keep this guy in his little container here until I transfer him to a bigger enclosed container and hopefully he will live because I am so frustrated with that plant. This one looked like he was about to die and I thought to myself, I'm never getting this plant again. But at this point, I think I would buy it again just because so far this one's doing well. So now we're kind of halfway through this process. If you're seeing value in what you're hearing here and you're enjoying this kind of content, please do drop a like below. It really helps the channel. Like a like, a subscribe, whatever you can throw down there. Doesn't cost anything as far as I know. At least YouTube hasn't started charging anybody for likes yet, so there's that. But it really does in terms of getting my content, the channel content pushed out to the broader YouTube audience and maybe to other plant YouTubers, recommendations, that kind of thing. I know there's a lot of channels who post content that are kind of along the same lines as mine. And it would be great to kind of you know, dig my little claws into their audiences a little bit too. I do plan on publishing more of this kind of stuff more frequently. And I think the next thing I'll do is maybe a tour of some of the plants I've got here and there. Just kind of talk about my setup in terms of how I've got my various tents and cabinets and things set up around the house. And I also do have like quite a good chunk of automation going on that might be interesting because like, you know, I work in tech, so automation kind of goes hand in hand with my line of work. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, subscribe to the channel and you will see more of it coming up. So for number six, we're going with another big boy. And this one, I think I've shown this to you guys in the past. Uh, this guy is my philodendron Dean McDowell. And this guy has put on some nice big leaves here. Now you're probably asking yourself, hey, wait a minute, didn't that plant look reasonably big the last time you showed it? And yeah, it did. And also this one had thrips too. The thrips, they really did a number on everything in my tent. So I ended up chopping a lot of some of the older leaves off. So as you can see, the stem here has a lot of leaves that have been removed. I've taken off leaves one, two, three, four. Oh, there's one right there. Pluck that guy off right there. I want to say five, six probably. This has gone through a lot of leaves and it is a survivor. So kind of got like mixed opinions on this plant. When it grows well, and you can see here, there's a brand new leaf coming in right here. Also, this was pushing up against the shelf inside of my grow tent shelving unit. And I hope it didn't damage the leaf coming up, but I'm pretty sure this one also had that problem and it looks pretty decent. So a little teensy bit of thrips damage on there, but otherwise looking okay. Now, the caveat here I'd say is that it is really prone to any kind of bugs. Every time I've grown it out a little bit, it has popped back with some sort of bug infestation within three months. So in terms of buying this one again, probably not. In terms of keeping the one I've got, yeah, I will because it is a pretty sweet looking plant. I'll just put that in the light there. You guys can see how cool of a plant that is. I mean, here's my head for head test. So it's it's as big as my head for sure. If I can hide my whole face behind it. And I'm expecting this big leaf coming out here to be even larger because already the petiole is thicker than the other two that are still left on here. And I mean, the leaf hasn't unfurled yet, but that's already looking pretty large. So I would expect that to be bigger. Now these guys, if you're not familiar with the philodendron Dean McDowell, this guy is a hybrid between the Gloriosum and the Pastazanum. So the Gloriosum is a crawler. The pasta, you can see it's got that kind of mixture of both in there. And I could see quite a lot of pastas anum in that midrib there. And I mean, like the heart shaped leaves, the growth habit, etc., are very Gloriosum. And even though this guy looks like he's standing straight up back here, he's still a crawler. He's just not laying down right now. Looking back at my previous comments on the Dean McDowell, it is tough. It has survived thrips. Now it's survived thrips again. So this thing has actually been through thrips at least two times now, maybe even a third time. I'm trying to remember if I had it at the time of my first thrips outbreak or not. Either way, it's definitely a survivor, but at the same time, it really gets munched. And if you can see on the back of the leaf here, there's still damage left on here. It survives, but it does seem to take quite a beating every time that the thrips emerge. And thrips are by far my worst enemy in this place. I have seen nary a mealybug, nothing like that. The spider mites don't seem to be much of an issue as well, but the thrips, they just keep on coming back and back and back. And like, I have killed them off over and over again as I've shown you in other plants, but this guy just seems to take the worst of the brunt of the beating and I end up chopping off leaves 
every time. So, I mean, the fact that you're seeing three leaves here, but I mean, look at where these three leaves are coming from. One, two, three. These are all the three newest leaves. Everything before that, gone. However, this was, and I should say, this was a very tiny plant at the beginning. It, was, it had a skinny stem that was smaller than this petiole, and it was probably about yay tall. So it sizes up super well. If you have an environment that is thrips free, I would highly recommend this plant. Personally, if I had to buy it over again, I probably wouldn't just because of the hassle it's caused me with the thrips. Now, if I didn't have that problem, I would definitely buy it again. So I'm gonna keep on keeping on with this guy and, and hopefully he thrives or at least continues to survive going forward. But my experience so far has been kind of middling. So as far as like buy, no buy, I think on this guy, I personally would say no buy for you. Depends on your environment. I think you might do better with the buy on this guy and like he is tough. So, I mean, there's that. And it is a beautiful plant once you get it. I mean, look at that. This is two leaves. Now imagine this thing with like 10 leaves. Go take a look at Kevin at Hakuna La Planta's channel. I'll link it if I can in the description below. He's got one of these things that is monstrously large. And if you go look on Instagram, I'll see if I can drop a couple of shots of what these guys look like in the wild, just kind of growing out in the open. They can be massive and they look so good. So it's got this pillowy finish to it. And just It's a really cool plant. And I mean, I wish I had the environment and the conditions to grow it a bit better because even in my own conditions that have been problematic for it, it's still alive and thriving. So based on all that, I would say, you know, it's a tough one for me. No, but for you, probably yes. All right, let's move on to number seven. I have an interesting one here. This is again an anthurium, and I'm going to show you why. It may not have a new leaf on it, but it has a new leaf on life. So uh, this guy is my anthurium pallidiflorum, and it has a number of leaves. Uh, it's also lost a number of leaves, but what's most interesting right now is that it actually has an inflow. So that is an inflorescence. Now, as far as I can tell, this is the first time that this plant has put out an inflow. I have never hybridized anthuriums before, so my experience with hybridization is purely based off of what I've watched and read from other folks doing it. I may take a sampling of what's on here once it's ready, but I'm not entirely sure. You can tell it's kind of small. Like here, I mean, here's my finger for comparison. I'm not sure if it's worth harvesting at this point. Once it's ready, it's not quite there yet from what I can see. But it also is putting out a new leaf at the same time. There is a new leaf coming in simultaneously. So it's got new growth of two different kinds. And again, you can see that I've left this in moss. So this has been sitting in sphagnum moss since I acquired it. It's been doing so well. This one specifically has been in my tent for a long time and it's put on a lot of new growth. I mean, look, look at this. Like this is pretty much as long as my SP Morona's new leaf there but it's so cool. It's such a neat looking leaf. I have a Wen Lingerai that I've shown you guys in the past. I will link the Wen Lingerai video up here, but this is still one of my favorite strappy anthuriums, the pendant anthuriums. I think the growth habit is pretty cool. If I was able to keep this like in a basket or something hanging inside my tent, I think I'm gonna try and do that because it's been sitting on like the corner of a shelf for a while and it's not the most stable location and it has fallen a couple of times. Thankfully, I haven't lost any leaves due to that, but I did lose a couple of leaves due to thrips. So I've plucked the leaves off. So you can see there's quite a bit of stem here. There's nothing going on, just a bunch of dried up husks here. And then we've got like one, two, three, four large leaves. We've got the inflow and we've got a new leaf coming in here. Oh, actually, there's something else too here. Is this another growth point? Huh. I don't know. There's a new leaf here and there's something else going on over here. So I don't know if this has two growth points or what. Um, it's possible because I did cut a leaf off due to the thrips. So it's possible that I cut the growing tip off at that point. Maybe now I have two growth points. I guess I'll check back in on this one in a month or two and let you know what happened. Long story short on this guy is that I did not have the heart to take him out of the moss that he was in because he was doing so well. And post thrips, the leaves that are left on here all look really good. This one's a little bit wonky that's over here, but like every other leaf, even on the back, there's not a lot of damage. There's a teensy bit on this guy here, which maybe you can see there's a little bit of a faint patch. Otherwise, all the other leaves are in really good shape. And this wonky leaf, 
I think it came out in the middle of an underwatering phase or while I was on vacation a ways back. So I'm going to repot it at some point. It needs to, I think to, to be able to grow any bigger, I think it needs to size up the container that it's in. So I would love to get this bigger. I would love to have those kind of two or three foot leaves you can get out of these guys. But the fact that I'm already hitting probably like 16, 18 inches on the newest couple of leaves here, to me, that means that it's pretty happy. And, you know, messing with an anthurium when it's happy is it's your own demise that you're wishing upon yourself. We'll see. And once it's popped out, whatever's going on, there's definitely a new leaf right over here. This one over here, I'm really not sure what that is, but I'll let you know. And then once those guys kind of solidify and stabilize, I'll move this into likely pawn. And then we'll see how things continue to grow after it acclimates, which is probably going to take another month or two after transfer. Now, returning to the subject of buy, no buy, given the opportunity again, absolutely yes. And the reason for that is not specifically due to my experience with it, but also due to the fact that this was a, a very expensive plant when I got this. I've actually had this plant for probably about two years now, maybe longer. And for the first year of its life, it lived in open air outside of my tent until last September, thereabouts. Since September, it's been much happier because at first it lost a couple of leaves, hence the long stem here. It wasn't doing the greatest out in open air. It was kind of surviving, but not thriving. But now that I've moved into a better environment, it's so much happier. And honestly, it's been pretty low maintenance since it's been in there. I'd say that now you can get a, an Anthurium palladiflorum for a pretty reasonable price. So out of curiosity, I just looked it up right now. On the Equigenera International site, this is going for $35 US. It's like a fraction of what I paid for it back in the day. And I know this is probably a seedling that you're getting for that price. Actually, it doesn't even say seedling. This might be a full-size plant. So, I mean, it's come down in price so much that you really can't go wrong getting this plant. It's such a cool plant. I mean, out of all of the pendant anthurums, if it's not the Wen Lingeri, then it's this one. Those are the two of the favorites that I've got. If you have an opportunity to get your hands on one, absolutely get one. It's worth it. Just And again, like it's not based off of my experience only with it, but just the fact that it's so cheap now and it used to be so expensive. So, I think we're up to plant number, plant number eight. This is a plastic bag, but inside of this plastic bag, and I've shown you this plant in the past, I think it may have been during one of my anthurium repot videos, if I can find it, I'll link it up here. I've shown you this plant in the past, and it has grown since then, but what this plant is, and you can't tell just by looking at this plastic bag, I'll tell you the story of the plastic bag in a second. I'm just gonna open it up and show you what's inside. So this is, and I'm not sure if you can really tell by looking at it, this leaf here has had some water damage, I think from being pressed up against the edges there. But this guy here, and it's got new leaves galore popping up, is an Anthurium papillolaminum. But look at this. Look at the growth on that stem. There's like, I don't know if it's pupping down there. It's got a whole bunch of stuff going on. Now this guy is an NSE papillolaminum, uh, as I was told when I bought it. So I'm not sure how much I trust that, but based off of the growth habit and I, the person who sold it to me, I believe was legit. So. This was a second-hand purchase, but this is a pappy that came from NSC Tropicals. I am very happy with this plant. It has been doing fantastically well, considering it has been in a plastic bag for a year and a half. You can see, look at this aerial root. This is hilarious. Like, this is a perfect aerial root. I could absolutely propagate this now. And all the other aerial roots have actually, like, gone into the substrate here. Not sure if you can really see that close up. I'll try and zoom in for you so you guys can take a better look at this. But like it's got roots galore. This is like a propagator's dream right now. There are so many points I could chop this at. So now I am completely paranoid about chopping this plant. So I'm probably not going to propagate it right away. But I could. I mean there's one, two, three aerial roots. Plus these are actually rooted up. So it's growing like a beast in here. Now this is a small container. This is like a 10 ounce cup I want to say that it's sitting in. But I mean, look at how many leaves it has already. I mean, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten leaves? Am I counting this right? I think it's ten. Maybe I'm miscounting. No, there's ten leaves on here. Ten leaves on a plant this small. I mean, the genetics on this plant seem like they're pretty good. And the fact that it's aerial rooting like crazy. Like, look at that. Look at the length of this thing. There's like a three and a half inch long aerial root on one side. More on the other side. Like, I can totally propagate the hell out of this. So I'm going to, but I'm going to let this keep on sizing up first. So I have this in like my maximum size Ziploc bag. It's been sitting in here inside of my Millsbow cabinet 
and I have been loath to take it out or do anything with it. Like actually, since I moved it back out of my tent where it was still in the plastic bag, back into the Millsmo, it's put out at least three new leaves since then. So if you're wondering how these plants survive in here in this plastic bag, I mean, this is no different than being in a prop box at this point. Every once in a while, I open up the top and I blow into it and refresh the air in here. I water it. I mean, there's still a decent amount of water sitting at the bottom. This cup actually has holes at the bottom, so it's actually just kind of recycling what's in there. So it kind of wicks up inside. It condenses at the top, drips back down again. There's a bit of a mini ecosystem going on inside of this bag. I've been very, very worried about it it being a thrips magnet thrips target since i've had so many problems with thrips i kept it in the bag just to keep it safe and since it's kind of like a precious plant i really don't want to do any damage to it now you guys all know like if you're familiar with nse pappies and just pappies in general getting a good quality one is hard and like i wanted to use this as like breeding stock down the line so eventually this guy hopefully will flower for me and the inflows can be harvested etc and i can do something with it but for now it's just a matter of keeping it happy, alive, probably sizing it up into a, a larger container pretty soon. And uh, I mean, for the time being, keeping it protected. So until I do a little bit of a reshuffle of my tent and my secondary rehab tent, which I think I've also shown you guys in the past. Now, once I've done that reshuffle and I feel a bit more confident than the airflow situation, etc., then I'm going to keep it out in the open in the tent. Until then, it's staying in that plastic bag. Now, buy again. Absolutely, given the chance, those are pretty hard to find a nice quality pappy that you know it came from a good source. I am not 100% sure this came from NSC Tropicals, but that's what I was told. The person who sold it to me seemed legit, told me that they had purchased a number of things from NSC Tropicals and had them imported in the past to Canada. This was obviously like a pup off of one of her plants, so I really hope she didn't screw me, but at the same time, it's doing really well and it looks good. So, and like quality wise, with a plant with good genetics and and good stock, you can kind of tell like it's it's not flimsy, it's not falling down, it's been living in not ideal climates and environments for quite a while now. So, to me, like plants that have bad genetics and have had problems in the past, you can tell they like they tend to fail pretty easily. And in this case, this guy has been doing so well for me that I tend to trust what I was told. I may be an idiot for doing that. If if that's the case, then, you know, what are you going to do? But, I mean, it's still a pappy from what I can tell. It is still a pappy and it looks good. So I'm going to let it size up a bit and I will check back in with you guys on that one later. So, like I said, purchase again. Yes, with the caveat that check where you're buying it from. I kind of bought it hoping because it was difficult to import from NSE Tropicals to here. For somebody who is not familiar, it was difficult to import. If you have the chance or opportunity, if you live close by, you live in the US, absolutely get your hands on one if you can. Get one with good genetics if you can. I would not recommend necessarily buying one of the Indo Pappies for that, just because a lot of them have questionable heritage and they may have been like cross pollinated or something coming down the pipe. So you don't really know what you're getting there. So I don't know if the risk is that much lower buying from North America, but it's probably a little bit lower enough that you're probably a little bit more confident in the quality of what you're buying. Also, the prices on Pappies haven't really gone down all that much. They have gone down, but not nearly as dramatically as other prices have gone down. Particularly on pure papillolaminums, like the price hasn't dropped all that much, even in the last year and a half. So as far as things go, it's a good investment plan too. So it's worth it from like a breeding standpoint. It's worth it from a price is stayed relatively stable standpoint. It's just more a matter of just like know where you're getting it from. All right, we are down to our final two plants. And the two plants that I'm going to show you are both very different. One of them, you can probably spot it back here. But the other one, this is a Hoya. This... <laughs> scraggly looking thing new growth right at the end here this guy here is a hoya silver dollar and the reason i picked this hoya specifically is just to show you how tough hoyas are and how easy it is to grow a hoya in like very little so to me the hoya silver dollar you can see kind of like there's quite a bit of wrinkling down to the bottom here I had not watered this guy for quite a bit of time. It was starting to soften up on these bottom leaves. You can see there's still a bit of wrinkling there going on. It was shriveling up because I hadn't watered it in such a long time. These leaves here are a lot more rigid and they kind of hold up to the bend quite a bit more. And that's because they're further along. So, you know, bottom leaves tend to take the worst of it in this kind of scenario. But look at this runner, uh, new leaf right at the end there. We got another leaf, it's a little bit wonky coming out here and another leaf. The silver dollar is a really cool kind of silvery Hoya that has 
almost a matte finish to the leaves. I don't know if that really shows particularly well there, but I really like the matte finish on here. Matte finish is not like a car, but you know what I mean. It, it's just the matte texture, the lack of shininess comparatively. And these guys have not been getting good light. Okay, that's the one thing. They've been getting intermittent light because I have a half busted LED lamp above these guys. And it's been in a plastic tub for the entire time that I've had it. Now, when I got it, this plant had, I think these two leaves at the bottom here, right? From here down. That I'm pretty sure that's what it had on it. And the rest of this has grown inside of the plastic tub that it's in. And I mean, I can easily propagate this if I want to. But the point of this whole thing was that, look at this container. This is like a two ounce shot glass or something. Maybe it's a two and a half ounce. Definitely no more than that. And the Hoya Silver Dollar rooted up. This was an unrooted cutting when I purchased it. So it was clipped on here. I think there's some like orchid bark in there. And I mean, this container is tiny and yet it's grown all of this out of nothing. Hoyas are very, very, very hardy plants. This one hasn't had any disease problems, but it's definitely had underwatering problems. So if you're looking for something tough that looks cool, then your Hoyas are where to go. And for me, Hoyas are not quite as sexy as the Anthuriums, as some of the Philodendrons, as some of the other plants I've got floating around, like Monsteras and Syngoniums and Epipremiums, etc. But like, they are so low maintenance, like ridiculously low maintenance compared to their kin. And it takes very little to let them go wild. Like I have a Hoya Matilde. It's gone bonkers in my Millsbo cabinet. And I've already cut it back multiple times and it just keeps on growing. And I forget to water that thing all the time. It's been sitting in pond the whole time it's been in there. And it's gone completely wild. Like there's no controlling the thing. It's like it's actually embedded itself in the frame of my Millsbo and in the backboards everywhere. So like, I know if I ever take that Millsbo apart, half of it's gonna be Hoya Matilde holding the whole thing together. So this guy, you can see it's actually got like adventitious roots growing on here. And this would be an easy propagation if I wanted to. I mean, it really doesn't take a whole lot. Like with Hoyas, you just can chop off two nodes, make sure you've got a few of these guys on there, a couple of those little adventitious roots and a node or two and you're good to go. This is a good purchase. I mean, I would definitely purchase this again. I think I got this after the price on the silver dollar had come down quite a bit. And I remember, I think it was Not Dude, who, if you haven't watched his channel, and I don't think he posts all that frequently anymore, but if you look back, I'm pretty sure he had a Hoya silver dollar. And he was also the one who introduced me to the Hoya Gunungading. Gunungading, I don't know how you pronounce it again. He was the one who introduced me to that from his videos. And I have two of those that are just kicking ass in different places in my house and the silver dollar was one of the ones i saw on his channel that i was like oh i need to have that one and at the time they were crazy expensive they were like mid triple digits two three hundred dollars for a cutting by the time i got this it was definitely down to the two digits but i mean you can tell this is like an easy propagation it's hardy like an ox it doesn't take much to grow in i mean this tiny container is what's happening here so highly recommended, worthwhile purchase if you can get it for a reasonable price. Easy to propagate, clearly easy to propagate. Like, look at this. This was an unrooted cutting. And, you know, it's worth the price of admission. So, uh, and it's just easy, easy maintenance. If you're really looking for easy, here you go. Again, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, questions about the plants that you saw, please do drop that comment below and I will answer every single comment on this video. All right, last but not least, the final plant that we have for you today. I know you've probably been staring at it over my shoulder here for a while, but the final plant for today would be the Anthurium Luxurians. This Lux has been through a lot too. I've shown it in a previous video, maybe my uh, ear guide video. The reason I'm bringing this guy out is because I think this is the newest leaf. It might've been the one on the front here. This guy, I've actually chopped off a couple of leaves. So you can see like the base of the stem here. There's a chopped leaf here. And there's another one on the other side. But what's really cool about this guy is that he's putting out a brand new leaf. And look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that red color, it's like a scarlet color. And it's so thick. It's got this dinosaur-esque kind of finish to it. This is why I really love all of the luxuriance crosses, just like the Magnificum Lux that's back here. These guys look so good and it's starting to get a little kind of ruffly edges just right there where the petiole meets the sinus, but 
This leaf is not hardened off yet. It is still bright red. The back of the leaf, you can see here, is quite pink. It's got a ways to go before it hardens off. And I am super looking forward to seeing how big this gets because the last couple of leaves, you know, this is like the size of my head. This one slightly larger, I want to say, a little bit bigger. And it's been in a tent that had a thrips attack where it lost only one leaf. The one leaf it lost was due to underwatering because I forgot to water it one time. I had looked at everything else but this one plant because it looked so healthy and I forgot to water it. Came back and I was like, ah, oh, I lost a leaf because it just dried out and kind of got desiccated. But you know what? The rest of the plant survived just fine. Roots are good. Everything's happy in here. I think you could probably use a pot up size at this point. But man, I love this plant. And this was such a great purchase. This is a, an Equigenera Lux that I got. When did I get this? I think I got it at the end of 2022. I might be wrong on that one. I've had this for probably close to a year now. Like, I feel like it was fall of last year, but maybe it's been longer. Maybe I've had this for two years. I honestly can't remember anymore. I have to go check my invoices and see if I can track it down. But look at the sinus on this thing. I mean, that I feel like this is going to be a big one when it gets to full size. This has lived in multiple climates in my house. Like, I've had it out in open air. I've had it in my tent. It has done well everywhere. And really, the only damage or stress that it's had has been when it got underwatered and even thrips, it barely made a notch in the damn thing. And I see like what looks like, I don't know if that's a new leaf coming out there. I don't know, we'll see what happens there, but there's something happening. This already looks like it's gonna be a fantastic addition to its collection of leaves. I think it would have had five leaves at this point if not for underwatering and thrips, but the leaves that are left have like no damage. It's beautiful. So if you're looking for a super hardy plant, like a super hardy plant. The Lux or any of its hybrids are absolutely worthwhile. I think I have a Pappy Lux seedling growing back there somewhere that I got from his Instagram is Bags Plants, but every Lux hybrid I have had now has been killer. And I know I had a Crystal Lux hybrid that is not in this video, but I will see if I can dig it up to show you. Any Lux, any chance you get for a Lux hybrid, like they're so hardy, they do so well. And they do great in pond. And like, I think they do well in pretty much every environment that I've had. Like they're so thick and sturdy. Like it's really tough to hurt those guys. If you're looking for something easy to take care of, absolutely. But in terms of buy again, 100%. I haven't had any bad experiences with any Lux or Lux hybrids. So absolutely give those a shot. Try them out. They're super easy to take care of. If you're looking for an entry level, like rare or they're not rare anymore, but uncommon and theorem, like you're not going to find it in your corner grocery store. You're not going to find it in Lowe's most likely. But if you're looking for something that is a little bit more uncommon and you're looking for something that you can show off because these guys look so nice, 100% recommend the Anthurium Luxurians. I have had nothing but success and good vibes from those things. Once again, I am Nick from Propist. This was 10 plants that have new growth for the month of September. If you enjoy this kind of content, please do drop a like below. Subscribe if you want to see more of it. If you're looking for something else to watch and you're interested in watching more stuff on the same topics I talked about here, I have this video up here on semi-hydro care and an introductory gear guide. If you already are into the hobby and you're just looking for some cool plants to look at, I have this Equigenera import wishlist plant video that is totally worth watching as well. Thanks again for your time and for spending it on my channel. I appreciate that and I will see you in the next one.